Welcome to Rational Astronomy. I'm super excited today because we're going to be talking about astronomy and I've got the guest that I've always wanted to interview, Phil Plate. Phil, thank you so much for coming down to the studio and welcome to the table. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It was really wonderful having you here. <laughs> we are primarily here, of course, to talk about your new book. It comes out right? April 18th. Oh, April 18th, okay. So if you're watching this after April 18th, it's out. Okay, if you're watching it before April 18th, it's not out yet. <laughs> um, but before we talk about Under Alien Skies, I'd like to go back to one of your earlier books. Sure. Death from the Skies. Yeah. Which I found fascinating. Oh, thank you. I really did, it was, it was amazing. I love the way that you write. You, oh, you, write, you write as you do on, on the TV programs. You make it explainable. Well, I like, to, um, I like to write the way I talk, and I like to talk the way I think. And uh, so sometimes there's a little meandering, yep. uh, a little off topic sometimes. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who loves this stuff, and I want to express it, and I, so I just do it the way I talk. And it's perfect. And, and it, it winds up connecting with people, and that works for me. So and it works for them. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> it's funny because when, when we think of our universe, we, we think of things like black holes and lo lots of nasty stuff out there that can kill us right. in a heartbeat. Right. The ones that scare me the most, magnetars. Yeah, that's a little esoteric. I mean, most people think of you know, asteroid impacts and black holes and exploding stars. And magnetars are weird. It's the core of a massive star that's blown up and it has about the mass of the sun, a little bit less, but it's compressed down into an object that may only be 10 miles across. I know. And so, you know, it's super dense, super high gravity, super hot, but in this case, super strong magnetic field. And so it's like a bar magnet, but it's like if you had, you know, 80 bazillion bar magnets all mm -hmm. squeezed together. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, the, the, the statistic I remember reading someplace is that it could strip a credit card clean from the distance of the moon. And, <laughs> that's cool. I don't know if that's true. It sounds good, um, but it actually sounds kind of legit. You know, when you get close enough to this thing, yes. um, even though the gravity will try to squish you down into, you know, thinner than a piece of paper, literally, um, the magnetic field is so strong it'll try to rip you apart in the opposite right. direction. And it actually rips the atoms apart, doesn't it? Uh, it can rip them, uh, it, it, well, can it rip the atoms apart? I, I think so. I mean, it could certainly pull two of them apart if they're okay. bonded together, okay. for example. Okay. Okay. The nucleus of an atom is bound together extremely tightly. Ah. Uh, so that's, that's a different story. But the thing is, even if it didn't have strong gravity, if you were on the surface of one of these things, yeah, it would, it would basically vaporize you just from its magnetic, magnetic strength. Crazy. At least I now know what I'm going to do for my summer vacation. <laughs> yes, yes. Avoid magnetars. Avoid magnetars is, Avoid I, magnetars is what, what you're thinking. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So let's now talk about Under Alien Skies, sure. your latest book. Thank you so much for sending these photographs. Absolutely. And, I, and they're I just love amazing. Pretty astronomy pictures. And when, I, when I first saw that one, I, I was looking at it going, why the heck has Phil sent me a photograph of a sunset? Or a sunrise. Right, or a lighthouse or Wrong. a smudge. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny how all these pictures are they're so cool and there's all kinds of neat things. And that one seems like, well, it's just a yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, first of all, that's a sunset on Mars, right? So this is taken by a rover sitting on another world. Mm -hmm. So right away, you know, that's amazing. It's an, an astonishing feat of technology uh, technology and technological yes. achievement. Um, but the thing I write about in the book, the, the book itself is I, when we try to come up with a, uh, a subtitle, and I said a sightseer's guide to the universe, because what I was trying to do in the book is say, you are here. Mm -hmm. um, everybody always asks me, well, what would these things look like if you were there? Because you see these gorgeous Hubble yes. or JWST images, and it's like, well, would it look like if, it would look like that if you were standing there? And the answer is usually no. Mm -hmm. But the more interesting answer is, well, what would it look like? And I started thinking about, well, what if you were in a planet orbiting a binary star, like mm -hmm. in Star Wars, yep. or inside a gas cloud, or near Saturn. And I really wanted to think about what this would look like. What would you experience if you were there? Not just, there's Saturn, there's its rings, look at the shadow. This is like, look around, what's it like? Uh, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do that because I had to imagine myself there. Absolutely. And, and Mars wound up being a lot more interesting than I expected. If you go out uh, near sunset, uh, on Earth, and you look up in the sky, the sky is blue, and that's because blue light from the sun is going in, in every direction, but it hits molecules in our atmosphere, and they bend that light back towards you. They sort of 
scatter it or mm -hmm. reflect it toward you. So if I look there, 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 I'm seeing blue light in every direction the sky is blue. When the sun gets near the horizon though, a lot of that blue light is blocked by junk in the air and that lets the red light through and so the sun looks red and the sky is blue. But on Mars, it's the other way around. There's all this dust in the air and that dust is made of iron oxide, it's rust, which is red, orange or whatever. And so when you look up in the sky in Mars, it's red everywhere. But that stuff tends to scatter blue light better. And so as the sun is getting near the horizon, the sky around it starts to look blue because there's a lot more stuff in the air that you're seeing that is sending that blue light toward you. Earth, blue sky, red sunset. Mars, red sky, blue sunset. And that's amazing. That's got to be so peculiar if you were standing there to see that and have it be the exact opposite of what you're used to. That would be a total mind and you know the next yeah. <laughs> word. I mean, that's amazing. It, it, it also shows you how strong they have to build the rovers because I hadn't imagined all this rust floating around in the atmosphere. Yeah, the rovers themselves don't rust. No. Um, because there's not really a lot of free oxygen in there to combine with the iron right. to form rust. Um, there's basically none. It's all carbon dioxide. In yes. There. But the oxygen that used to be in the air there has combined with the iron to make this rusty stuff and it, it's, it's on the rocks and all over the place and mm -hmm. it's it's been eroded down into like a like a very fine, almost like flour or smaller. Oh wow! And, so and it's, like, just, it's like talcum powder then. Talcum it's, powder would be a better example. Yeah. Wow. And wow. the wind blows it everywhere. The air on Mars is very thin, but yes. it's there, and it blows it up into the atmosphere, and it it, it covers the planet. When you look at Mars, you go out. If you went out tonight, Mars is up, and you could see it. It looks red, it, orange, or red, like rust. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because I'd always thought that's how the surface looked. And I'm wrong. It's basically the atmosphere. It's both. It's both. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's in the air and it's also just covering a lot of the That's truly a lot amazing. Of the it's a weird place. Let's move on a little bit. Okay. Asteroid Bennu. Bennu, yes. The photographs are amazing, but when I saw this, I, I've been following astronomy, astronomy since I was a pretty young kid. I believe that this is one of the most amazing space photographs I've ever seen. It almost looks like the gravel road going up to my old house. <laughs> <laughs> right, you should really consider uh, uh, grading that, that road. Um, those, th those rocks will pop your tires too. Yes. Actually, you know what? I'm, I, I shouldn't have said that. They won't. I was thinking they're very jagged, but typically on these asteroids, these rocks are very brittle. Ah. And if you could grab one, you could crush it in your hand. Uh, they're very porous. Um, when I was a kid, Asteroids were just dots of light in the yes. sky, and that's where, that's where the name comes from. Aster, like star, and mm -hmm. oid meaning kind of, yeah. you know, so they're star-like. Um, but then we started sending probes to them and seeing them up close, and this is taken by a probe with the name OSIRIS-REx, and it's this twisted acronym of origin something something. Mm -hmm. um, you can look it up. Uh, but the fact is it, it, it went to Bennu, orbited this asteroid, and actually went down to the surface and um, collected samples. Yes. And there's another asteroid called Ryugu, which was visited by a Japanese probe called uh, Hayabusa 2, around the same time. And they're both around the same size. Um, this one is about 500 yards, 500 meters across. Mm -hmm. Ryugu's a little bit bigger. Um, but they're both what we call rubble piles. And this yeah. was kind of a surprise. We thought that asteroids were solid rocks, monoliths. And they're not, not the little ones at least, they are collections of rubble. They're literally like yeah. bags of rock. Like, like a vacuum cleaner. Held together by their own gravity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you went to a construction site and you would see this amount yes. of rocks, it's kind of what you're seeing. Um, and that was a surprise. And it's not 100% clear why they're like this. It's, it's possible that they've suffered repeated collisions which have shattered them in place, mm -hmm. or they've actually gotten hit, which has blown them apart, but only gently. And so the gravity pulls oh, it, then back brings together. it back together again. And then the shape has to do with their spin and the way rocks tumble around on them and everything. And yeah, and so when you, you look at these things and the entire surface, when you look at that, the entire surface is rubble. Yes. There's like no clear spots or very few uh, and there's no dust. And we expected to see lots of dust because these rocks break down over time. They get hot and cold as yeah. the asteroid spins. Tiny little meteorite impacts will tend to turn them into dust. But it turns out that um, all that dust gets sh 
basically anti-percolated into the <laughs> asteroid itself. It falls down into the asteroid because they're mostly empty space. It's just rocks yes. uh, in a pile. So yeah. they're mostly space. I mean, I never thought, I'm going to call it gravel. I never thought sure. I'd see a photograph of gravel from space. Yeah, and be careful too because that rock, it's called gargoyle sexum. Uh, sexum means boulder in Latin. And, and gargoyle because it kind of looks like a gargoyle. And it's it's um, it's large. It, like the, the, the little white rock you see on the uh, sitting on its surface is the size of a person. Ah, and okay. And so it's actually quite big. This thing is yes. roughly the size of a house. And we see rocks like that, and they're just sitting on the surface. It's weird. Yes. Uh, and um, down to down to pieces that are no bigger than, than gravel. Unbelievable. Dust. I'm going to be forever stunned by that yeah, photograph. it's amazing. It's funny you should mention about when you were a kid, because when I was a kid, I've got, I, looked, I had a, an old astronomy book at home from 1955. Oh, do you remember what it was? I can't remember the title offhand, but okay. I, I, was, I had a quick look at it last night. Oh, nice. And it was interesting because every star is just a pinpoint. There is no definition right. of any star. And it's sort of, I'm looking at that going, and then looking at my computer screen going, wow. <laughs> St I mean, all right, stars. I, you know, I, I'm 70, okay? <laughs> but to do, this, to do this in that short period of time is amazing. Yeah, the, the progress that I've seen over my, just my career, let alone yeah. uh, my life, uh, has been pretty staggering. And now it turns out my career, I think about it, my career has been more than half my life. And it's getting to be a larger percentage every day. That's kind of a grim thing to think about. Um, but yeah, when I was a kid, we didn't have lots of space telescopes and, and we hadn't, We'd only just started going to the moon. Right. Uh, never visited an asteroid or sent probes to the planets or anything like that. In the book, I'm writing a lot about what it's like to be on a planet orbiting a star someplace else. Mm -hmm. And you know, the first half of the book is solar system. It's Mars and the moon and Saturn and Pluto. But then the rest of it is other planets. And we didn't know if other planets existed right. outside the solar system. And then in, uh, in uh, the early 90s, we started discovering them. And then in the, in the mid 90s, we started discovering them around stars like the sun. Mm -hmm. And now we know they're everywhere. And we went from not knowing any to having, we have over 5,000 now. Yes. And a friend of mine just tweeted this a couple of days ago. She is uh, Jessie Christensen. She's an exoplanet astronomer. Uh, she's sort of in charge of the database where, mm -hmm. we, where everybody, just you know, the list of all the planets we know of. And she predicts that um, in 10 or so years, we may have a, over 100,000 yes. known planets orbiting other stars. And that's and there's, unbelievable. There's, how many stars are in the Milky Way? It's about two billion. Hundreds isn't it? of billions. Oh, really? Hundreds that, of billions. Yeah, it, it's getting a census is hard. Okay. Uh, so I can I can but, pretty well yeah. say yes. I do believe there is life out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what it's like is a different question. That's a different question. And, totally. And for me, the question of life is still open. We don't know. Right. But the fact of the matter is um, we find planets around so many stars that it seems like planets orbit the majority of stars. Yes. So it's not even are there planets out there. It's like what stars don't have planets. planets. Yeah, yeah, it's a little that's, weird to think that way. That's going to be a real discovery. Yeah. So, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> of course, we could have life closer to home if Europa turns out to be a possibility. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> These are amazing photographs of Saturn. Yes. And, and, and I will quickly tell people that the little black dot is represented by this. And we're going to talk about this one right at the end. But a hexagon on Saturn? Yeah, that seems weird, doesn't it? When you look at that, uh, I love that overall shot. These are, yes. these are all taken by the Cassini spacecraft, which orbited Saturn for almost uh, a little over 13 years or about 13 years, and um, took amazing pictures from far away and up close. Mm -hmm. And we've learned as much about Saturn in, the, in that decade and or plus a few as we had for centuries right. beforehand about this planet. And one of the weird things is that it's a, it's a gas giant. It's this immense planet. It's almost 10 times wider than Earth. Um, so it's really quite huge, and it's almost all atmosphere. So the atmosphere that you're seeing there, you're looking at the tops of the clouds, and those go down a long way. Yes. And so you get these weird... Atmospheric patterns, like these bands that go all the way around that we don't really see on Earth. Kind of, but, you know, like yeah. the jet stream, and it's like that. But then this hexagon at the North Pole, and it was like, what is this? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the conspiracy theorists went nuts. You know, oh, it's like, course. oh, the Illuminati are controlling. No, it's nothing <laughs> like that. It turns out that if you have a rotating fluid, something that flows, yes. and air is a fluid, um, and you have winds that blow at different speeds, 
you wind up naturally getting these geometric patterns. Oh. It's really weird. Uh, and you can show that. You can take a, a rotating table like, like this big. Scientists have done this and put a camera above it and, and had two fluids and just spun it around. Mm -hmm. And the inner fluid will form like a, a hexagon. You get these regular polygons out of it. And so it's, it's, uh, it's just the way fluids flow. It can be counterintuitive completely to what you expect by watching air on Earth. But in fact, there are things like this on Earth. The jet stream tends to form a very rough polygon. It's just, oh, okay. in Saturn, it's just these yes. wonderful, you know, straight sides. And by the way, those sides are like um, 9,000 miles long. Yes. So the Earth would fit comfortably in between the two yes. vertices of, of that. And that, that's an amazing yeah, it's thought huge. just. Because that's the thing about the scale of the universe. You could hardly grasp it. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, everything's really big. difficult. Everything's big. Really big mm -hmm. and a long way away. Let's talk about uh, NGC 6388. Yes, that is that. That is what we call a globular cluster. Okay. And there are different kinds of clusters of stars. The sun is pretty much by itself in the sky. And there are some stars that are binary. It's two stars yes. going around each other. But there are also clusters where there might be dozens or hundreds or thousands of stars. Uh, and then there are globular clusters which have maybe a million, up to a million. Oh, wow. So this object has hundreds of thousands of stars in it, and there's, they're very densely packed in the center. Mm -hmm. The nearest star to the sun is the Alpha Centauri system. It's a triple star system, and it's four light years away. In that same volume inside a globular cluster, you can have thousands of stars. Oh, wow. Right? There's empty space between us and, and Alpha yes. Centauri, but it, there could be thousands of stars or, or more in a globular cluster like that. So they're Ooh, very great. tightly packed, and uh, they're gorgeous. Um, I always love looking at them through a telescope. They're mm -hmm. just beautiful. Uh, and through big telescopes like this one taken from Hubble, you can really see yes. the stars in them. And uh, I have a chapter in the book about what it would be like to orbit a planet, to, to stand on a planet orbiting a star in a globular cluster. And it would be amazing because a lot of these stars are incredibly luminous, mm -hmm. uh, much brighter than the sun. And so even if they were far away, they'd be visible during the day. So you'd probably see a handful of stars even in broad daylight. Right. And then as the sun would start to set, or your star would start to set, um, thousands and thousands of stars yes. would pop out. And so our night sky seems like, if you go to a dark site, looks like there's you know so many stars in the sky, and that would feel like an empty canvas compared to what you would see in a globular cluster sky, especially if the core of the cluster rose. Yes. And you would, you, it would be like it would look like this picture hanging in your sky. Right. It would be unbelievable life changing that would be and truly gorgeous. unbelievable so the white dot in the middle is just an immense packed number of stars yeah it, they look solid in the center oh and they do through, they do through any telescope yeah uh, but yeah they're not that's just so many stars packed in there their light is the, all blurred it, together it, yes is there a chance that could turn into a, a, a more traditional galaxy or not enough mass yet. Oh, that's a complicated question. In that case, they're, they're too small. I should say uh, that. They, they Typically, they're just too small. And over time, a lot of the more massive stars fall to the center and the lighter stars bubble yeah. away. And so they actually lose stars over time and oh. they get smaller. But we also think that some globular clusters are remnants of small galaxies that got torn apart by bigger ones. So like we live in a big galaxy and if small galaxies get too close to us, they get torn apart and eaten. Our galaxy yes. consumes them and they become a part of us. And a lot of these clusters may be sort of the leftover dense cores of these galaxies that oh, survived. They're, they're the indigestible mm. bits that our galaxy couldn't, uh, couldn't right. basically swallow. Sadly, you and I are not going to be around when Andromeda <clears throat> plows into us. Well, that's, that's four billion years from now. Uh, and, and, and honestly, we're not even sure that's going to happen now. Oh, really? Um, Andromeda is another big galaxy yes. like us. It's two and a half million light years away, and it is heading toward us. But is it heading toward us or kinda toward us? Oh, okay. And there's some indication it's kind of moving away, and it'll that we'll, we'll circle each other and then combine and then sometime combine. later. But right now, it's not. That's right. not clear. If it's heading right at us, yeah, in yeah. about three and a half, four billion years, boom, boom and we're yeah. going to emerge. The, the, the one thing I I, I I found fascinating was you, you, you think of the size of the Milky Way, you think of the size of Andromeda, the number of suns involved. Even if it plowed straight into us, the chances of a sun hitting a sun is pretty remote. Yeah. Pretty darn small. Galaxies are mostly empty space. Yes. Uh, and that's another thing about scale. Um, stars are big mm -hmm. a million miles across. 
roughly. Some of them are smaller, some bigger, close enough. Um, but the distance between stars is trillions of miles, typically in a typically, galaxy, yes. like out where we are. And it, it's even tens of trillions. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about an object that's a millionth of that distance. Yes. So a tiny, tiny, tiny. It's like having two dust motes floating in a room. What are the odds? Of them actually They'll collide. coming together. Yeah. 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 Um, now, in the centers <laughs> of galaxies, they're closer together. And so you will have horrible things happening in there. But right. out where we are, yeah, the chances of, a, of us two stars colliding is basically zero. Yeah. Pretty, pretty darn small. Yeah, it's weird. Let's move on a little bit. Yes. Barnard 68. One of my favorite objects in the whole sky. Now, I'm guessing here, is that a dust cloud? Yes, it is. And is that a picture taken by Webb? No. Oh. Um, that's a good guess, <laughs> and it's close. But um, the first picture where it's very dark is just taken by a telescope that is seeing light. Yeah, that, visible light. The same kind of light that yes. we see, visible light. And this is a, it's just a cloud of dust, and what astronomers call dust are tiny, tiny grains of silicates, which are basically rock, mm -hmm. or uh, carbon molecules that are complicated and, and very opaque, and that's basically soot. So it's like, it's rocky dust and soot, and it collects, <laughs> it, you get them in these clouds, and this stuff is really opaque. And um, it's, it's everywhere in space, but in some places it's co more concentrated, and that's what Barnard 68, it's a tiny cloud, mm -hmm. a light year across, something like that, and it has about as much mass in it as the sun does. So it is collapsing and will eventually form a star. Oh, wow. Not for a long time. Yes. But it will form a star. Uh, but the thing is, we can't see in it. It's so opaque that you can see all these stars around it. Those stars are all behind it. And the stars that are behind, directly behind it, their light's blocked. You just cannot you see just them. You just cannot see them. Uh, but that's visible light. In infrared, Firefighters use infrared cameras because infrared cameras can penetrate through smoke better than visible light can. You go into a room, smoke is filled with smoke, if there's a person there you don't know, the infrared light coming off of a person, because you're warm and you emit yes. this light, can be seen by these cameras. And it's the same thing here. The optical light, the visible light from these stars is blocked by all this dust, but infrared can get through. And so when you use an infrared telescope, a camera that can see infrared light, suddenly all these stars are visible oh, suddenly become behind visible. this thing. And that's really cool because we can um, look at these stars, figure out what kind of stars they are, measure how much infrared light is coming through, and learn about the dust cloud, how dense it is, what kind of dust it is, how big the grains are and everything. And so that's what led us to realize, that, oh, this thing probably will form a sun-like star some you know millions, yeah, millions of years, of years, years yeah, from whatever, now, sometime in the future. Yeah. But if you were in the middle of that, if you were, if there were a star in the middle of that, and you, you were on a planet standing there, and this is what I talk about again in the book, you'd look up and see an utterly black sky. There wouldn't be any stars in the sky at all, except for the one you're orbiting. That dense. Yeah. It's wow. Amazing. Yeah. That so, is you know, amazing. What what kind of mythology would you have? Yes. Right. And a and a planet where you don't have any stars. I I love thinking about stuff like that. Let's talk a little bit about Orion. Yeah. That's Beautiful. the Orion Nebula. Yeah, this is one of the most celebrated objects in the sky. This is a gas cloud, and it's huge. It's, it's a couple of dozen light years across. So this is an immense object. And it's one of the, uh, it is, well, it is the closest active star-forming region that is forming, like, really massive luminous stars. And so in the center, where it's very bright, there are a handful of stars that are much, much, much more luminous than the sun. And they are lighting up all the gas there. And that's what ah, you're seeing That's in what this. we're seeing. And it's, um, it's, the, it's the middle star in Orion's dagger. So if you were to go out on a winter night and look up at Orion, you'll see those three stars hanging from his belt. The middle one is this is object. That. And that is, that is forming stars even as we are talking about it. That's incredible. And so you're seeing all that, that beautiful uh, color in there is all different kinds of gas. Hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. There's just yeah. all kinds of stuff in there. And they all glow at different colors. And we can tell what's inside that gas by, by the colors that right. it's glowing. Now, is that artificially colored or do you think that's probably straight off the plate? Um, if you'll pardon it's, it's, the uh, term. Yeah, <laughs> I never like that anymore with digital cameras. Um, we use filters that select out the light from these uh, gases. So hydrogen does, in fact, glow red. Oxygen can be blue or green. They, they glow at different colors, and you can use these different filters. But then after the fact, the person making the image can then color them the way they want. Um, this is fairly close to true color, right? The right, colors okay. these gases are actually okay. making. But it's never quite really accurate the well, way your eye would see it, because our eyes just work differently than cameras do. Right. I think a lot of people believe that most of stuff out there is just black and white. And of course it's not. It's not. 
It definitely isn't. Most of the stars you see are just white because they're not yes. bright enough to make your color, your eyes see color. But the brightest ones are, and so you can see a handful of stars that look blue or red, but everything else just <clears> looks <throat> white, but that's the fault is in ourselves and not the stars. Right. So Looking here we are seeing there. that stars being born. Exactly. That is a stellar nursery. That is a stellar nursery. And you can see it with your own eye. So it's a bit like the fingers of God or the towers of creation or whatever yeah, you wish to call it. That's a it. different object, but it's a very, very okay. similar object. That's the Eagle Nebula, and that is also forming stars. There are lots and lots of places like this in our galaxy because our galaxy is still yes. cranking out stars even today. Yeah, the Pillars of God, I read somewhere that uh, one of the stars on the edge of it had uh, gone supernova and it was blowing one of the fingers away. Yeah, I read that paper, and um, there have been some other papers saying, well, maybe, and it's one of these things where well, yeah. we're not 100% sure. Not 100%. Sure, but there's evidence because um, it's making massive stars that are much more massive, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun, and those stars explode when they die. Right. And that is a very violent explosion, and it can, yes, yeah, sweep out that gas and blow right. away. So it's, it's absolutely possible that something like that can happen. The question is, is it happening right now? And that's, right. And astronomers that we, love arguing yeah. about stuff like that. The trouble is things happen in space so slowly over such long extended periods of time, it's very hard yeah. to really judge what's happening. That, that, is, that is true almost all the time. There are yeah. some things that do happen where, for example, there are stars blowing out gas in the Orion Nebula, and we have such high resolution pictures of them from Hubble that over years you can see you can this actually, gas you moving. Can, yes. Yeah, then that always blows me away. Absolutely. Because when I was a kid, yeah, you were never going to get shots like that. Never. But now we have these amazing scopes. Right. T talking about uh, novas and supernovas, I think it's worth stressing, the gold ring on your finger came from the heart of the sun. Uh, a star similar to the sun. Um, well, oh, yeah. no, when I say there, sun, yeah. I meant a sun. A, a star, sun. Yeah. Um, yeah. The universe, when the universe formed, it only had hydrogen and helium in it, and a, a, a tiny, tiny bit of lithium. But then stars formed, and in the cores of stars, it smashes these atoms together and creates heavier elements. And eventually, you can get things like calcium and iron, and there's calcium in your bones and your mm -hmm. teeth, and iron in your blood, and that literally formed in the core of a star, and the only reason it got into our planet and our sun is because that star exploded right. and scattered that stuff throughout the galaxy. So literally, everything in your body, even the phosphorus in your DNA, yes. came from stars that uh, died long ago. It's amazing. And I could have one star in this arm and a different star in this arm. Yeah. A field of study right now is to find out you know, what kinds of stars blew up as the sun was forming and may have seeded and, that material. Oh, okay. And it's we can the, actually figure that out. And it's the amount of material. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, we think of the Earth as big. Yes, right? but... It's tiny. We're, it's oh, tiny. We're insignificant. Yeah. The, the sun has 300,000 times the mass of the Earth. Yes. And so, yeah, the Earth is kind of insignificant on that scale. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Let's wander back to Saturn. Yes, a my good, favorite planet. A good place to wander back to. The very last photograph that we have here, which represents... As we said, the little black dot on that one. Talk about this storm. This is, this is amazing. That is a, it, it's, it's a kind of a hurricane. You can think of it that way, right? You, you've got yes. a swirling mass of, of gases at Saturn's North Pole. Uh, and um, we have similar things on other planets, mm -hmm. but this one is, is really sharply defined. It's lovely, and this, these are false color images from the Cassini spacecraft. So, you know, what you're seeing is red and sort of, sort of sea green there. Not really red, not really green, um, but it's easier to see what's going well, on yeah, when you it, color them. It, it pops out the detail. Yeah, and you can see that there are, there are sort of storms inside the storm, right? There are, there are clouds here, separate clouds with, in, inside of the swirling mass. And I, I don't think anybody really expected that. From Earth, this would appear as a dot. Mm -hmm. But you've got to realize that this thing is well over 1,000 miles across, right? right? We're talking about something well over 1,000. I mean, this is sort of the continental U.S.-sized mm -hmm. object um, sitting inside of, a, of a, that hexagon, which is the size of a you know, planet. It's bigger than Earth. Uh, and so the, the scale of these, of these gas giants is just immense. Right. And, yeah, so we can see this. And, and it's interesting to, to learn because... Because Saturn is all atmosphere and the Earth is not, we have an atmosphere and then this solid surface, the way air moves on the Earth is different than Saturn. And we get a lot of heat from the sun, which affects mm -hmm. our weather. Saturn doesn't. It's much farther out from the sun. It's much colder. And a lot of its heat is bubbling up from inside. So the processes that generate weather on Earth, very different here. Yes. But a lot of the equations that we use are the same. 
So what's happening is we have similar equations, but different things that are making them work. So that helps us test and understand our understanding of physics. So it's um, these kind of things by learning how, how the air is rising and sinking and swirling and what it's made of and how cold it is and the pressures teaches us more about how weather works on Earth. And weather on Earth is very complicated. Yes. So studying these other planets is actually teaching us about our own planet because it's all the same science. Ah. And that's a good reason to do it. And also, look at it. Look at it. <laughs> that is unbelievable. And, and the fact that we have you know, a spacecraft the size of a school bus yes. that was orbiting Saturn for so long that was able to send stuff like this back. Uh, destroys me. I love it. I follow the Cassini and unbelievable what they were able to do. Yeah. You know, probes down to other little uh, moons. Yeah. Uh, just incredible stuff. I have a whole chapter in my book about what it would be like to visit Saturn in a spaceship and actually go inside the atmosphere and float oh, like in a balloon. Yes. yes. Like, a, like a honeymoon vacation in a gondola <laughs> under a balloon. Um, and it was a lot of fun to picture that. But uh, without Cassini, I don't know if I would have had the imagination. And all the details in the rings and these peculiar structures and everything. And it's like, I could have written a whole book just, you know, talking about what it would be like. All the, it has dozens of weird moons, the rings, the planet. Uh, there's just no end of, of glory and magnificence visiting a planet like that. I know. And that's, that was just one thing to be able to write right. about. Now, it's interesting because you said it is so cold. Mm -hmm. out where Saturn is. So where does the heat come from? Is that a little bit of Boyle's law kicking in with the pressure? K kinda. Um, with with the, the outer planets, the fact that they're not frozen completely is because when they formed, you have gas streaming in and it, it's hot. Um, if you think about like a, a, an asteroid hitting the Earth's surface, it, it's moving very quickly. It has a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And when it hits, it releases all that energy as light and heat. Well, when these planets form, it's like, you know, as this material's f flowing in, it's like getting hit by gigant gigantic asteroids all the time. It's a huge amount of energy, and it gets trapped in the center. Oh. So the Earth's core is very hot. Yes. Partially for that reason. It was, it's heat left over from the formation. Plus, there's all these layers of rock above it that insulate it. And so it takes a long time for that, for that energy, that heat, to get to the, to the surface and radiate away. So that's mostly where the heat from these outer planets is coming from. That is, that, is, that is a stunning explanation because I would never have dreamed that that could possibly, that, that it would retain the heat yeah. for this length of time. And there is, there is some heat being generated by radioactivity. Okay. There's uranium in there and that makes heat. Okay. And there's other, there are other forces as well too. And it's actually hard to figure out exactly how those all balance. You know, what's the, right. sort of the budget? How much is coming from this and how much from that? But the fact that we can know this at all to me, it's yes. astonishing. It truly is amazing. Well, it's an amazing universe, yes. isn't it? Let's be honest about it. I think so. It. That's Absolutely. why I like writing about it. Before I uh, came down here today, I was looking a little bit at your credits, and oh, I, I, I know I know you have looked through here and said, "Well, wait a minute, I don't, that's not right." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a couple of them, you know, can't trust IMDb a hundred percent. But there's one thing in there that is right. You worked on the movie Arrival. Yes, in, in a kind, sort of, sort of. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's one of the first, uh, one of the best first encounter films produced. Yeah, yeah, I really do. The yeah. way the way the storyline is put together, the tentativeness about what they should do next, and the aliens were really alien, and they were really alien. They perceive reality differently than yes. we do, and I really enjoyed that. Yes, uh, it's based on a wonderful short story called "The Story of You," and you can look that up. Uh, and the movie extrapolates from there, but. Uh, Years ago, um, I was in Los Angeles visiting various production companies and things, just giving sort of random advice. It was a, a part of a thing called the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a group which puts sort of scientists and creative people together. Uh, you know, if we're making movies or games mm -hmm. or TV shows or whatever. Yeah. And I was visiting this, this one group and we were talking about something completely different. It was a, a movie that was gonna be about going to the moon. Uh, and afterwards, the, the producer said, hey, you know, we've got the script for a movie that we're going to be distributing um, if you want to take a look at it. And I was like, oh, neat, you know, and oh, Amy Adams is going to be in it. I like her. And I read the script and it was amazing. Uh, and I, it, this wasn't anything official, it wasn't anything formal, but I sent an email back and said, you know, you know at one point, the, this character, which wound up being played by Jeremy, Rem uh, Jeremy Renner, says, are the aliens trying to signal us? Have we seen anything like a Fourier series? And I thought, well... 
a Fourier series isn't like a series of numbers. It's more like a mathematical mm -hmm. process. And I said, I think you mean Fibonacci, and that's an actual sequence of numbers. And then I went to see the movie, and I'd completely forgotten about this. And then Jeremy Renner says, oh, they, they send us a Fibonacci series? And I was like, I made him say that. Um, and I had just a, a couple of comments like that about like what the aliens would be like if, if they don't perceive time the way we are. And they, they, they don't have, you know, we have eyes in the front of our head. And mm -hmm. so we see forward, and we think of things behind us. And everything is framed like that. We think of, you know, we look ahead to the future and we have to turn around to look pa into the yes. past. But these are all just because of our physiology. And if these aliens have seven sides to them and they don't see forward or ahead, they're going to perceive time. That's, that's why they perceive time differently. And so I wrote a little bit about that and everything. And a lot of that stuff made it into the movie. Excellent. Not as no. I wrote it, but it was just an idea. So it was really cool but it was all very informal. I just sent an email. So I was just thinking about this, you know, and it, yeah, and he wound up giving it to the, to the writer, uh, Eric Heiser, and I wound up meeting him later and we nice. talked about some stuff. And that was really interesting. And he's gone on to do some, you know, small movies like Bird Box and a couple of other things. Yeah. Like, um, but yeah, and, and so I love, I'm a big science fiction dork, mm -hmm. love sci-fi. Sci um, and knowing that a lot of these movies and TV shows, there's an official science advisor for Star Trek now, Erin McDonald, she has a PhD, she's a friend of mine, um, and she advises them on all their science. And the shows now, the science on Star Trek's a lot better than it used to be. Uh, and, and the beauty of it is that they want to make the science as accurate as possible. Right. Not, you can't make it perfect because the story has to come first. But I just love that they're listening to the science and mm -hmm. the science can inform the story. Uh, and it makes the it makes the movie or the TV show feel more real. Yes. And so I, I just love that, and I love being able to be a part of it in some small way with a yeah. handful of TV shows and movies. That's why I really liked uh, Expanse. The Expanse. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That was one really well put together TV show. Yeah. Most it was of the just action. Just amazing. Most of the action and, and the stuff is yeah. very accurate. And there were times when. Um, the science was so accurate, they actually used it yes. to move the plot along. And so, yeah, the, the two guys who wrote the books, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they really are, they wanted the science to be accurate. And the series had science advisors. Yeah. They contacted me about one visual scene oh, okay. at one point. So that was kind of interesting. That was like, kind of oh. nice. Yeah, they approached Jupiter. And I was like, oh, yeah, I helped with that. That was it. That's all I did. Um, but, yeah, that, that show is amazing. The it, books it, are even better. Yes. It's a series of nine books, and they're phenomenal. I turned my daughter Vanessa onto it, and she just loved that show. My wife is not a big science fiction fan. I mean, she likes, yeah. like any other genre, she'll watch it. Uh, but yeah, she was always excited when a New Expanse episode. And that's hard sci-fi. It's a complex, oh, yes. deep show. I mean, the only thing they did which isn't proven is they sort of managed to get their engines to work a little bit better than we're able to. Yeah, it's that was just the one. Drive. The, well, and there's there are spoilers, there yeah. are aliens in it, but that's not right. the way you think of them. That's and, right. Season, yeah. season two will be with us in five years' time because that's how long it's going to take us to get to Saturn. It wasn't <laughs> yes. going to work. Yes, yes. You have to have fusion <laughs> drives that work so well that you can actually, you know, get from here to Jupiter yeah. in less than, you know, six years. I've or got two like final that. questions. First question. And this really is talking about arrival. Do you believe we will ever solve the problem of being able to travel to another star in a lifetime? In a lifetime, that's a good question. Um, we almost have the technology to do that now. Oh, okay. Um, these chemical rockets that we use that you know, basically light hydrogen or something on fire and throw it out the back um, are great, but they, don't, they can't get you moving very fast. Right. And the nearest star is 24 trillion miles away. That's a long way. Uh, and so it would take tens of thousands of years to get there. Yes. Now, um, there are other technologies that we're working on that could shorten that time significantly. But, you know, a lifetime, you're talking about 70 years. Or, you know, do you really want to get yeah. there in, in 10 years? Yes. And then you're talking about getting up to a very large fraction of the speed of light. And that's just pretty much no matter how you dice it, um, we don't have that tech. Uh, and so the question then becomes, can you ever go faster than light? And the answer is probably not. Probably um, not, but I mean... The way we understand physics now, but who knows in 100 years what we'll think of. That's true. But with, the, with a fusion drive, with something that basically smashes atoms together and that releases an immense amount of energy, um, you can get 
moving pretty fast. And if you have enough fuel, you can get up to a good fraction of the speed of light. Oh, really? Uh, Interesting. But we just don't have that technology now. And it's, it's Right. But it's something they're, they're working on. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, mean, okay. they, we're working on fusion technology now. I mean, that's what the sun does. It works. Yes. Um, but, you know, you don't want to have to have a star to make that much energy. Right. Uh, it's just hard to do. And nuclear bombs work that way, too. Mm -hmm. But it's uncontrolled. And what you want to be able to control it. You don't want to necessarily ignite a nuclear bomb in the back of your rocket. Right. Although there is a rocket called the Orion, which was thought up in the 50s, which literally did, had a huge sort of hemispherical steel plate. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, huge, like hundreds of yards across. And it would ignite nuclear weapons in the back, and the, the heat from that would vaporize the iron, and would get so hot it would blow out the back like oh, a rocket wow. exhaust. Uh, yeah, so it's not a subtle rocket. Right. Um, and you're, you're, you know, you're igniting <laughs> nuclear weapons in the back. And you can go pretty fast, but the problem is, you know, how do you build something that size? How do you yes. make that many bombs? You can't launch it from Earth because you're igniting nuclear bombs uh, and you're polluting space. You're, you're, yes. There's just so much garbage coming out of the back of this thing that, you know, what do you do? Not the best technology. My last question. Who's your favorite science fiction writer? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know... Um, that's a tough question because I grew up, and with all the names you've heard of, if you're a science fiction fan, Heinlein and Asimov and yeah. Clark, uh, and then Larry Niven when I got a little bit older. Um, and the thing is now, and I, haven't, I don't read a lot of science fiction now because I'm too busy writing it. You know, it's like, do you relax with a book at the end of the day? It's like, no. It's like, do you ask a construction worker, do you relax with a sledgehammer at the end of the day? It's like, this is what I do all day long. Um, but... Um, I get to meet science fiction authors these days a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's like yes. John Scalzi is a friend of mine, and I love his stuff, and uh, some uh, some other folks. Um, but I'm uh, because I don't read as much. I want, and, and TV has gotten so good with the Expanse and all of these shows yep. that it's a lot of these writers that I uh, you know putting out these um, like like Star Trek is just so good. Strange New Worlds is so good, and Picard right now, and all of these great shows. And so a lot of these writers. Uh, are wonderful as well, and it's it's just such a huge variety, and and what styles you like, and uh, uh, N.K. Jemisin, and oh, uh, it's just it's too hard to pick. One of my favorite shows was Battlestar Galactica, the old one or the new one, but both actually, <laughs> both actually. Yeah, I quite enjoyed the old one. When the I was old, a kid, the yeah. old, the old one. They hammed it up a little bit more. Oh well. The new one was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Until the last four episodes. A lot of people say that. And, and what I have I said, it. and what I have said is, science fiction writers do never ever say, and then God did it. I felt the way when I first saw it. Okay. And then I watched it again, and a friend of mine, Kevin Grazier, mm -hmm. was the science advisor for that show, and so a lot of the stuff that they did on that show, where you go, that's interesting. It's probably his his yeah his, yeah. his fingers were in it. You know, the science of it, I mean. And he said, you know, we we telegraphed this from the very first episode, that that. The, the Cylons, yes. the, the big difference between the Cylons and the humans is the Cylons were monotheistic and the humans were polytheistic. And they believed in a physical existing God. Mm -hmm. And um, this whole time where there's, you know, where, where the character Gaius is, is picturing this, this Cylon woman, right. um, it's never really explained throughout the whole show. And no. at the end you realize she's an angel, you know, an angel. Oh. And it's like, it, it feels wrong. It's like, oh, you're, you're putting all this religion in this science fiction, and I understand that. But in, in the end, it's like, actually, this was all, all along. And I have some issues with the end where they go to Earth and mm -hmm. why are they human and all that. And in the end, that's sort of like, well, God did it that way. Yeah. Um, but all of the stuff that seemed weird and, and wedged in there, turns out, no, actually, if you watch it again, it's, it's all telegraphed yes. the whole time. Yeah, no, so I, 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 did, I did get that, so, but... Yeah, and I understand, and I understand why everybody reacted that way, but I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to forgive it. And also, it was just so amazingly well done. And, it was. Yeah. And, and you could see how they saved up budget dollars from when they would do one show where it was all taking place on Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, ship in a bottle then, show. Then the, the, the next show would have lots of action sequences and yeah. then nothing again for a couple of shows. So. And one of my favorite things about that is, just, is also to, to, to bring this back, too is a lot of the actors on those shows were raised on the science fiction that you and I were raised on. Right. right? So they watch Star Trek and they watch Battlestar and, th and they became actors. And, and Will Wheaton on Star Trek talks about this. Yes. That, that he loved Star Trek as a, when he was really little, got to be on Star Trek, and now is a huge Star Trek nerd, even though he's part of the show. Right. And he was inspired by, and a lot of actors say, or excuse me, a lot of scientists say they were inspired by 
these actors. I certainly was. Shows like Space 1999. Yes. Uh, what a great show that was. I love that show. Uh, <laughs> and Star Trek and all these things. And now you have actors who were inspired by the old shows and so and they love the science. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've, one of the more rewarding things is being a science fiction fan is getting to meet some of these actors like Aaron Douglas played Chief on Battlestar and he's a science nerd. Jerry Ryan who plays Seven of Nine on Star Trek Huge science nerd, not necessarily astronomy. She does like right. astronomy. She she's she is into more forensics and, and medical examining stuff. Oh, okay. She was on a show like that, and but she was really into it. Uh, and a lot of these actors are really into it, and they talk about it. And you know, I go on these shows and talk about science, like we have been for the past sixteen hours. I think is how long I've been on. You have to tune in because you like that stuff. You're like, oh, right. I've heard of this astronomer guy. I want to hear what he has yeah. to say. But you know, Jerry Ryan just shows up on camera and people are gonna to listen to her because she's a big TV star. Right. And when she mentions the science in something like that, that's, she's gonna do more for science outreach than I can in a lifetime. Yes. So I love this. I love that they love the science, they wanna talk about it, and, um, and they, they follow scientists on social media and all that stuff, it's great. Right. I love it. I mean, science, when you start looking into it, it's just an amazing topic that we could talk. We could talk for hours <laughs> <Yeah>. on. <laughs> and not just, not just this. I mean, not, there's just not so just many this. wonderful Ac things. Across, across the board, it's yeah. amazing. It's Phil, everybody. it's been an absolute pleasure Thank meeting you, you talking to you, talking about your new book. Obviously, I get very excited about this stuff. Under Alien Skies. Ah, there's the red light. <laughs> that's, that's me right there. <laughs> Always fun to write a book and actually see it. It's like a uh, real to hold it. Yeah, it's not just not just letters on a on a computer screen. That's wonderful. <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this show. It's been an absolute pleasure sitting here talking with Phil, talking about a subject that I just love. So thank you very much for tuning in. I'm Nigel Aves, your host. We're coming to you live from the uh, Captain's Lounge Studios. Signing off for now. Goodbye. Goodbye.